Well, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Scott Ages. I'm with the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you all to the final day of our 2009 Sync Up Conference here at the Jazz and Heritage Center. As you know, the Jazz and Heritage Foundation is the nonprofit organization that owns the world famous Jazz and Heritage Festival presented by Shell. We use the proceeds from that incredible event for year round programming in the areas of education, economic development, and cultural events. Um, this conference is a new initiative of, our, of ours that we started last year. We're very pleased to host it in our re most recent acquisition, this building, the Jazz and Heritage Center, which we are in the process of converting into an educational center. Um, I uh, ask your forbearance uh, for the heat in the room. As I've explained to some of our previous uh, workshop sessions, the air conditioning system was stolen after Katrina, so we're still in the process of replacing all that. So thanks for your patience and bearing with us. Y'all are the diehards. You're, you're the hardcore. It's Saturday morning, second weekend of Jazz Fest, been getting up at this hour to be here. So congratulations to you all. How many of y'all were out all night last night checking out the band? <laughs> well, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Next year, we're going to either do this at midnight or at 7 o'clock in the morning, so you can just roll straight in from the shows. Um, as, as you probably recall, uh, originally at this time, we had scheduled a presentation, a, a keynote presentation by Gerald Seligman from the Womex organization headquartered in Berlin. Unfortunately, Peter called at the very last minute saying that he was suffering from a, an illness that would not allow him to travel. So he had to cancel his trip and we're sorry about that, but we know he'll be here next year and we're looking forward to having him. Who did I say was Gerald? I'm sorry, I'm like, it's been a long week. Gerald Seligman from Womex was uh, the guy <laughs> that couldn't make it. Um, in, in, in place of Gerald's presentation, I would like to take a few moments and give you all a sneak peek at an update of a program that we launched la at this conference last year. It's called the Jazz and Heritage Talent Exchange. And this is it. The Jazz and Heritage Talent Exchange is a website. It's a free service of the Jazz and Heritage Foundation that has been generously supported by Louisiana Economic Development, uh, the, the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism, the Louisiana Division of the Arts, and our own radio station, WWOZ. Um, the purpose of this website is to serve as a directory of Louisiana music so that professional talent buyers, especially event organizers and film and television producers, can easily find, locate, and hire the Louisiana musicians who can do a great job for their events around the world. So I want to very quickly go through this site a little bit and show you some of the functionality. Uh, if you were here last year, then you saw us unveil this site. Um, Chris Schultz with Voodoo Ventures and his company have put this site together for us, and, and I want to thank them for all of their hard work and their effort in getting the first version off the ground and getting the second version off the ground, and we're really thrilled for all of your hard work. Tim Kappel, who is here, has been our administrator for this site for the past year. And one of the big changes in the site is that for the past year, it has been up to Tim to upload all of the artist information and we were only able to accommodate one song per artist. Now, artists will have, the, or whoever manages the artist's page on their behalf, will have the ability not only to upload their own content and edit their own content, but they will also have the ability to add multiple songs so that you can show a broader range of your repertoire. So I'm just going to show it to you very quickly um, how it works. You can go through the navigation and see what we're about. Uh, basically, it's a project of the foundation. It's a free service for the purposes that I told you. It's got um, some basic information on the FAQ. We're not charging any commissions. We are not agenting your, your gigs. We are not middlemanning. We are just providing a service here. And there is a, a search tab, but I, I generally prefer to use the, the, the browse tabs. And as you can see, we have broken, we've got about 200 and some 
artists currently listed in the site. From zero artists at this time last year to, to now, we've gotten 200 artists on here. We are always looking for more artists. This is open to every artist in the state of Louisiana, regardless of what type of music you play. And if you lived in Louisiana before Katrina, and live somewhere else now, we'll still call you a Louisiana artist. So feel free to, to check into this site. Um, you'll see that we have a list of genres here. And it tells you how many artists are actually in the database for those genres. And we don't show any genre for which there is no entry. Some entries only have one. But if you, if you sign up as an artist, and you are a type of artist that is not currently listed in any of these genres, it will up this list will update when you say if you are if you had ambient new wave Latin klezmer and that was not currently in here, if you put that in, it will show up in the database. Now you can be in more than one genre, you can be in more than one mood. Um, now here we have the artists by name, so you can get a sense of who is in here. And if we show all, you'll see that it, the list is quite extensive. And we also now have a lot of very high-level Louisiana performers. We have, where's Beausoleil? Is it supposed to be in here somewhere? Mm, not seeing them. Might not have been updated. Uh, but we've got Cowboy Mouth in here. We've got Beausoleil. We've got Terrence Simeon. Uh, we've also made it a, a policy of the foundation, which, as some of you may know, the foundation puts on a series of free festivals throughout the year. We are now asking that every artist that we book for any of those other festivals be listed in this talent exchange. And we're hoping that over time we'll find many more uses for it. Um, so if uh, one, of the, one of the key audiences for this site are festival promoters from around the world. So they may know an artist by name that they can look for, but they may just be looking for a particular type of music. They may be looking for blues, for example. if I'm in Australia and produce a blues festival, that might be what I'm looking for, especially one that uh, presents a lot of Louisiana music. And you can, this, so this is the list of who's currently in the database under blues, and the yellow button is to add to your playlist, the green button is to just demo the song. And so that's Anders Osborne, and if you're just a, a very, uh, if you're a person on a very tight deadline, you might listen to three or four seconds and say, Nah, not what I'm looking for. Go to the next guy. Pretty good, not exactly what I had in mind. I want to hear me some chili in you. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Just kidding, Jay. We love you, Jay. <laughs> but let's, let's say you checked out that song. OK, this is definitely what I'm looking for. So now I want to drill down, and I'm going to find more detail on that artist. Now, I am not currently logged in on the site, but I'm going to show you the, the, the sign-in process really quickly. So w this is one of the things that's new with the site. In the past, there was no such thing as a user account. Now we're asking people to create free user accounts. And the purpose for that is, you'll see in a moment, that people will be able to do more sophisticated communication through the site. In the past, we had a rather um, rudimentary artist contact process where basically if you said contact this artist what it did was it opened up your email and you, saw, you sent off an email to that artist. Let's see where am I going? Sorry I was looking for blues. Yeah all right now all right let's say I'm a person who is signed in as a talent buyer and I know the name of the art whoops I'm no, I know the name of the artist that I'm looking for so I can go to Spencer and I can search, whoops, no, don't do that to me today. All right, here we go. So this is, now it's come up with Spencer's page. Now, okay, I'm signed in as a talent buyer and I've already demoed his song, I like it. I think it's great, I've read Spencer's bio, I've gone to Spencer's webpage and I've determined that this is a person of character and experience and is gonna do a terrific job for me at my blues festival in Australia and I've heard enough of your song, thank you. I just want to book you for my festival. Bing. So click on book. I want you, whoops, what'd you do to me? Guys, whoops, what happened? Let's try it again. Book this artist, okay. 
I want to hire you today. And you click that message. You can read it when you get home, Spence. <laughs> and it, it sends him an email right through our internal messaging system saying that a talent buyer has int indicated interest in hiring Spencer for his festival. Similarly, if I am a film or television producer and I know that I need a blues song for a scene in a juke joint in a, a movie that might be filming in Louisiana, and I get tax credits back but for all the music that I'm uh, buying in Louisiana because I'm already part of the tax credit program, I just decide that I want to license your song. I got 5,000 bucks for you right now, I'm, I'm going to use your song. So similarly, I'm going to send you a message through this website. And that really is the purpose. That, that is the whole reason why we're doing this. So uh, we just want to try to make sure that if there is a buyer out there, a, a, a professional buyer, that if they're looking for something from Louisiana, that they've got a one-stop shop. They've got a simple place to go where they can find it that serves them to them in a very simple and easily understandable way the, the essential information that they need. They don't need to look at your necessarily your MySpace page that tells me how many friends you have and shows all sorts of bells and swiggles and, and can be really confusing to look at. This is just very, very simple. Similarly, if, I, if I'm a film person, I can look by mood. And see, and so this is a list of all the the moods that are currently in our in our database. And if I'm doing a car chase scene, I may need something that's aggressive. So what's in the database that's aggressive? And there's all this stuff that's. What was the question? Well, we ask that now that the artists upload their own data, we for, first we ask them to set. The question was, how do they determine what the mood is? And we ask the artist to tell us what they think the mood is. And we, in, our, in this case Tim, would listen to the song. And if you said that the, the mood was angry, and we listened to the song, and we said, you know, that's actually a love song. And it sounds very peaceful and complacent. Then we'll add peaceful. We won't take angry out. We won't change it. But we'll add a more relevant descriptor. And we also, and I'm going to ask Tim in a minute to show you what, it, what the, what the sign-up process looks like when you're an artist and some of the info that you have to put on here. So um, you can search by genre. You can search by mood. You can search by tempo. Because for, for films, they often need to know specifically, is it fast, slow, moderate, et cetera? If you know the song title or you're just curious about what the song titles are, you can look that way. You can even look by key signature. And let's see, it, it'll, when you get into it, it'll give you more specifics, A sharp, minor, et cetera. And we ask the artist to provide that information. But fortunately, Tim is also a musician, so he can listen to your song and tell if it's A sharp minor or G sharp minor. Right? But I prefer that you provide it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yes, I can. So, um, now, we haven't had artists upload their tour pages recently, so we probably don't have much by way of tour date information. I'm going to just see if there's anything in here right now. Probably not, because the database was recently swept clean. So if what's going to happen next week is that all of the artists, all the 200 artists that were previously listed in this site are going to get an email. And it's going to say, guess what? Talent exchange has changed. You now have an individual user account with which you can upload all your own data. And once a month, you're going to get an email reminder from us saying, please update your tour date page and tell us what gigs you have coming up. Because the talent buyers will have the ability, especially the festival talent buyers, will have the ability to search by date, by region of the world, by country. So if, for example, I am a blues festival promoter in Australia, and I have an event that takes place in April, I could very easily go to this website and say, I am looking for Australia April Blues. It would hopefully come up with a list of 15 different local Louisiana artists, if any of those artists happen to be playing in Australia. So the art, what, the, what the, the festival promoter, promoter would hopefully say is, ah, this artist is already going to be in Australia. I don't have to pay for the plane ticket. They're already going to be here. You got a gig, bing, and they would and they would hire you that way. Similarly, if I'm a jazz festival promoter in Finland, 
I might look for, and my event is at the end of November, I will have the ability to search by Scandinavia, November, jazz. And if any of our artists have updated their pages and they happen to have a gig in Norway in mid-November, it could very well happen that the uh, jazz promoter in Finland with an event two weeks later would hire you because you're already over there and you don't have to travel back and forth across the seas. Now, what happens? You want to get into this site? You want to join? We have three types of user accounts. An artist, which for our purposes is really the most important one because the artists have the control over or whoever sets up the artist page. The artist may have a booking agent that will take care of setting up the artist page on their behalf or a record label or a manager, somebody to, like that. And I'm not going to go through all of this right now. I'm going to ask Tim to show that. But um, also the other main um, accounts are for music supervisors, for film and TV people, or video games for that matter, or festivals, live performance people. And we ask that you set up a user account so that we know who you are and so that we can contact you. Now, interestingly, and what I would like people to know is that the artist information, the, the artist contact information is shared to anyone who uses the site because we want people to be able to find the artists. There is not, however, on this site anywhere a list, and I want all the professional buyers in the room to be put at ease about this. All of the, there is no list of the professional buyers on this site. There is no means for artists to contact the buyers. And the reason for that is that we want to protect the buyer's privacy, and we don't want them getting inundated with unwanted solicitations. It's, it's a one-way communication. So the, the talent buyer, once they set up their user account, has the ability to make a, con a contact to the artist. The artist then can reply, and they can engage in a two-way dialogue at that point. But the, the communication can only be initiated by the purchaser, and we did that on purpose. If we find over time that there was a lot of resistance to that, we can certainly change that mechanism. But we feel that for now, this is the most effective way of preventing, well, basically making sure that if, if we're advertising this site in Polestar and Billboard and Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and to other trade publications around the world, we want the professionals who use this site to be comfortable knowing that just because they put their information in here, they're not suddenly going to get inundated with 500 email solicitations from artists that, that are doing their job, trying to get more gigs for themselves. We want them to be comfortable to know that this is really a, a place for them to be able to search in, in frankly, in relative anonymity. And again, as I said, if, if that turns out to be um, not the best way to go about it, we can change that uh, when the time comes. But for now, that, that's the way we're going. So we're, we're logging in. All right, so I'm currently logged in as a talent buyer. I'm going to log out. And I've shown you the essential components of uh, make, initiating a contact with an artist. You, you look through the genre. You look through the mood. You can look for a specific artist. You've, you've looked through the list, you've listened to the music, you've determined who it is that you're interested in. You can save those artists to a playlist, you can come back and listen to it later. If somebody were to contact me as a site administrator and they said, look, I need some recommendations on blues artists or bluegrass artists for that matter, what can you send me? I can make and save a playlist and send it to those people and they can preview it that way through the site. Um, so it's helpful for the buyers to be able to come back at another day and say, okay, I listened to ten, 10 artists on this site. Rather than going back through the entire beta database and retracing my steps in my search, I'll just come back and see who I'm interested in. Yeah, we have to put ourselves in, for example, I sing jazz, but I also sing blues. Do I have to put myself in twice? The question is, can, must I submit myself in multiple genres mm -hmm. or moods for that matter? And the answer is, you don't, it's not, it's required that you list at least one so you have to put in at least one. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Tim demonstrate that aspect of what the artist sign up is like. And yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what if you're an African dance troupe mm -hmm. or um, you know Mardi Gras Indian gang or something? This is open to all of those. Okay. This is not specific to music. This is we're and our intention is to open this up to various disciplines. It's going to be a little bit harder to put visual artists in here, but performing arts in general, so dance troops, all of that, we have definitely anticipated that this is a resource for them as well. OK, so um, what I'd like now is to ask Tim Kappel, who has worked so hard on this site 
over the past year to come up and walk you through a little bit of and show you what an artist sign up is, is going to look like and demonstrate for you a little bit of um, the, Im the information that we ask the artist to provide and how it, uh, the site anticipates the fact that so many of our artists are independent and handle their own booking, handle their own licensing, et cetera. So, Tim. All right, all right. So, um, how many of you remember the site from last year, it's version 1.0? So, as you can see, the site is, is a lot different. Um, and oh, we've. Tim, since we're on the homepage, talk about the featured artists and the, and the oh. other. Um, so that, that's going to be changeable. Sure. Um, as you, there's three designations that we have on the homepage. Um, and we have the ability to select you know, a featured artist if there's a, a, a band or a group that Scott really falls in love with and really wants to push them. Uh, he can set it so that they're uh, the featured artist. The popular, uh, popular artist designation generally goes to the um, artist who's getting the most page views or the most song plays. So somebody who's really just kind of burning up the site. Automatically. Automatically, right. And then the, the new artist designation goes to the person who's uh, you know, created their account most recently. And that's all done automatically. Um, but yeah, like I said, the featured artist is something that the administrators can change. Like if we fall in love with a band, really want to push them. Um, if, you, if you're not an artist, you're not a talent buyer, you're not a music supervisor, um, but you really just kind of want to stay in touch with what's going on on the site, you can uh, sign up for the newsletter and just you know, throw your email address in there and we'll get you information on the site. It's also, say you're an artist but you don't have any recordings right now, you're, you're in the studio working and you, know, you just don't have anything to put up yet, um, you know, stay in touch through the, uh, through the newsletter and let us know when you do get some stuff up there. So uh, instead of, uh, I'm gonna show you this page one more time. If you're an artist, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, your username, this, you can change this once you get in there, but just use your, whatever username you typically use for, you know, your other sites, MySpace, Facebook, or, or whatever, just something that's, that's easily remembered. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and sign into my, um, sort of test artist account just to give you an idea of what we have going on. All right, so a couple things to note on this page. Once you, si you sign up as an artist, uh, what you're going to see is this. And this is where you start. It, this is all the data that I used to input for you, and this is something that's going to be on, on you to input yourself now. Um, of course, if you are having problems with this, you can always feel free to contact the site administrator. It'll go to me or Scott and we can help you with any of this. One of the things that we're trying to, to utilize a lot is um, are these little tool tips. So next week when you go in to create your account or update your account, if you have you know, a question about what are they asking me for here, you can always click on the tool tip and it should tell you. Um, all right, so this is the general artist page. And, and your question was like, if, if I'm in more genre than one. Okay, well, if you span more than one genre, be sure to select more than one. Every, every genre that, you're, that you feel that you're legitimately in, put that there. Well, I just have to select it. I don't have to put it in different accounts. Nope. You can, you can see, you, you see right there, you may select multiple genres by holding control and, and selecting. Okay. So um, similar artists or influences. This is particularly important for people who are, uh, well, for everybody, but for people who are unknown, um, if I liken myself to Bruce Springsteen, then that's what I'm going to put in there because I want people to, uh, who like Bruce Springsteen to be able to know, uh, well, I'm not going to be able to license a Springsteen track for this, but maybe I can find something that sounds like it. So that's where we highly encourage you to put that in there. Um, obviously, that's self-explanatory, biography, photo. This is, all of you have video embed links on uh, YouTube or whatever, please put that on there especially for people who are looking to get booked for live performances. Because if, I don't know if any of you were here last week, but every panelist up here, when they're talking about live performance, they said they want to see you perform live. And if you don't have a YouTube video or something, then they're just going to keep going. Um, so uh, all this information you can enter yourself. This is one important feature that we want to know for ourselves because we want to know more about you. Um, 
but what we have here is artist or band books its own gigs. So if you do book your own gigs, even if it's under a different name, like or your girlfriend or boyfriend does it for you, be sure you click that because you know what that's basically telling us is I don't have you know a, a booking agency so to speak work for me, but that's business. When when we go to the state and we say, look, this is what. Uh, the business that we have in the music business that we have in Louisiana, we can point to sites like this. So be sure to click that. And what it'll do is it'll auto populate that field for you with all the information that you've already provided. So, next, I want to show you uh, after you do your basic um, artist information, I'll show you what. Uh, <laughs> Skinny ties aren't in anymore. No, no one, no one got me that memo. Um, all right, so I've already uploaded a couple of songs, but the upload process is, is pretty simple. If you were to have gone here and you didn't have any songs, like, hey, do you want to upload a song? You can you browse and you, you find, well, let me just show you. This is what it would look like. So it says, you know, choose a file, select song, and then add song, and then it would upload. But since I already have some songs on here, let me just briefly show you. Um, what this data entry process is like. So as you can see, we have spaces in here for song title, tempo, key signature, all those features that Scott was showing you, whether it's browse or search, they all rely on this information. So the more information you provide, the more likely you are to get seen. If you don't know your key signature or, you know, what, it just that's fine, but maybe indicate that to the site administrator, we can probably help you out. Um, or if any of these things you don't know. Um, in terms of, this is kind of a feature that I, we may want to explain a little bit. So say Scott, I, you also see who the writers are, but if, uh, let's say Scott was also a writer on here, on this song, and he's represented by BMI as a writer, and you just click add writer to list, and there's Scott. So I want 80% of the publishing. No way. <laughs> 75. All, all, wrestling. All, wrestling. <laughs> all right, so now we have, uh, this is, Similar to the booking information, we want to know if you own or administer your own rights. It's very important for us to know. So please click if you own uh, the master recording or you administer the, the master recording yourself, and if you own the composition or administer the composition yourself. A lot of people want to know if it's only original material that we accept on the site. As a general rule, it's better for you to have uh, original material on there. So, in other words, somebody else, you know, don't put a cover, somebody else's composition, because we want you to get paid. That's the whole point of the site. Is, and if somebody was to license that song, you would get paid for the master recording, but you wouldn't get paid for the composition. That would go to the other, to the songwriter. Keep in mind also that if you don't have uh, <laughs> permission to post if somebody else's composition online, please do not submit it. We are taking no responsibility for double checking you on your clearances. Just because you have a, a, um, a mechanical license, maybe you pay Harry Fox to, in order to record a song and put it on your album, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right to put this, that song online. So keep that in mind. Best bet is to just submit an original material. So that's why I say the general rule is just to do that. Um, for me, I own or administer my rights, but I do it under different names. As you can see, I have a little LLC called Twin Crescent Music Group, and my publishing company is called Crescent City Music. So I, I'm sure to put that in there. Um, now, back to genres. You have artist genres. You as an artist have a genre. But you're, this song, say you're a jazz artist, but this song is a little bit more bluesy than it is jazz. Well, that's where you want to really reflect the genre of the song. If the song is bluesy, but you're, you consider yourself a jazz artist, don't put jazz. That's not going to help anybody. Just put whatever that song is. You had a, a space earlier to put where what you felt your genre was as an artist. This genre is for song only. And then again, with the, you have the mood designation as well. Yeah, question. What if you have like a mix of different, you know, like genres? As an artist or the song? As as the song, well, that's fine. I mean, if you feel the song it doesn't fit cleanly into one specific genre, that's perfectly fine for you to do it. But say you have a song that's bluesy and funky, but you also do jazz stuff on the side. You would just put blues and funk. You wouldn't put jazz. Now, when you upload in your artist page, when you're creating your artist page, you would put blues, funk, and jazz. So that would make people go to your page even more to see what kind of different styles of blues you do. 
Well, what, they're, what, what you don't want to happen is, is say somebody's searching for a, a jazz song, mm -hmm. all right? And you're a jazz artist, but you, and they type in jazz, they search for jazz, and they go to your song, but it's bluesy and funky. They're going to be upset yeah. because they didn't get what they were looking for. Okay. And so that's what we want to avoid. We want to have this as specific as possible. Now, if, if for a live talent buyer, they would be searching for you as under those other genres. So just keep in mind, there's a different genre for the artist than there is for the songs. Um, okay, and that's about it. Um, also, just one other thing that I, I do want to show you all, um, and this is handled administratively um, at the moment, but we do have what's called certificates, and we will be able to show um, people who are looking to license your music, whether or not it's considered an in-state spend for tax credit purposes. And that's kind of what this little certificate th there means. Um, and then the last thing I'll show you is, this is your how you would upload your performances. And we highly encourage, and we'll send you emails um, reminding you to update your performance list. But just, you know, pretty simple date, region, country, city, and venue. And that's basically it. So if, if, you ha if you're doing it and you have any questions, please feel free. Always contact the site administrator. Um, and, and it, me, me, Scott, somebody else, you know, we're sort of anonymous. Yeah, question. How are you promoting it? How are you promoting it? Buyers and. Well, you know, we've done, we haven't done any promotion over the past year. It's all been word of mouth. We've gotten 250 artists just through word of mouth. And so, but it's. We've advertised. I mean, there's going to be advertising uh, that Scott's going to engage in. Um, for the buyers, right. Right, so the, we've spent the past year advertising the existence of this site to the artist community. Right, hoping right. Hoping to build up the database. We were frankly hoping to have more than 200 at this point. We're hoping to have 500. We haven't quite gotten there. But now that the functionality of the site is pretty much where it needs to be, now is the point where we start advertising this to the buyer community. So Polestar, Billboard, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, and so we'll start to drive some traffic to it. But that means, doesn't mean that we are gonna stop advertising to artists, we're going to ask people to continually subscribe to this and become artists on this site um, for as long as we're able to keep it going. All right, well, Tim, thank you. And now I'd like to invite our panelists to come up to the, whoop, to the podium. All right. I want to thank, once again, Chris Schultz and Pete Bodenheimer with Voodoo Ventures Flat Sourcing. Uh, that has built this site for us. How about a round of applause for our website developers? Well, we're waiting for our panelists to take the stage. Um, what, what's the feedback on this website so far? Do, do y'all understand what we're trying to do with it? Y'all getting it? How, how many are artists in the room who are already on the site? How many artists in the room who are not on the site? Okay, well, now you know what to do. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate that. So, Rick, uh, you guys want to come on up? And Luciano, you, want, you guys want to come on up? Okay. Uh, let me explain a little bit about the, the tax credits. And Tim was talking about the certificates for uh, Louisiana artists. As some of you may know, back in 2002, uh, Peter, whenever you're ready, uh, the state of Louisiana instituted a very aggressive program to encourage film production in the state by offering tax incentives uh, in the form of credits uh, to, um, to film producers. Hey, Peter, how are you? Okay, Lana, thanks. Um, the tax credit is now 25% or more a, uh, return on what they spend on, uh, on production here in, in Louisiana. When the law was revised in 2005, it was made much more explicit that, uh, are we missing a chair? Do we, do we need one more chair? Yeah, missing Peter Talati. Might, might need one more chair. Um, can you grab me one more chair? I think we need one. Uh, it was made much more explicit that when a film is, is shooting in Louisiana, any money that they spend on music, their music budget is also um, a part of their what we call the in-state spend. So when a uh, we're gonna, Peter, we're going to get a chair for you. When um, when the so what the, what for the investor, 
what matters is whether they're writing a check to somebody in Louisiana or not. And as you know, if somebody's licensing a piece of music, they need to license both the master recording from the record label as well as the song itself from the publisher. If that uh, song is um, by an independent Louisiana artist, or even, not necessarily an independent Louisiana artist, but if the, the person that controls the master, the, the master recording rights and the publishing rights is in Louisiana, so if both of the addresses in our database for publishing and master are in Louisiana, then that means both sides are considered in-state spends. So the film producer, when they see that little symbol, they will know that for all of the money that they're spending to license that song is an in-state spend. So that is money, uh, that's an expenditure that can be counted against their, uh, their uh, film production budget for tax credit purposes, which means they're getting 25% back on whatever they spend to license that song. So that's what that's about. Okay. Oh, well, thank you all for being here. I'm very, very pleased to be able to present to you all our extremely distinguished panel of um, so experienced uh, talent buyers and also talent representatives. Um, we've got Peter Himberger with Impact Artist Management, uh, manages Dr. John, um, the Gypsy Kings. Uh, how many other artists do you manage? They come and they Shannon go. <laughs> but Shannon McNally as well. But you've managed Dr. John for a very long time. And the Gypsy Kings. And well. the Gypsy Kings as well. Rick Mitchell from the Houston International Festival. Just flew in this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, and your festival is a two week a two weekend festival that just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. One week ago. One week ago. Well, so so you're tired. Thank you for making the trip. Lisa Stafford from the Festival International de Louisiane and Lafayette, Louisiana. That was last weekend as well. So thank you for being here. Peter Talati from the Joy of Jazz Festival in Johannesburg, South Africa. Peter, thank you so much for being here. How many, how many years has your festival been going now? 15 years. 15 years, awesome. Luciano Lindsay from La Casa del Jazz in Rome, Italy, which is a beautiful facility that presents concerts as well as festivals. Peter Noble from the Byron Bay Blues Fest in Australia. Hmm? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here. He just arrived. His, he just concluded the 20th edition of his festival with well over 85,000 people participating. And Hugh Southern, Southard from Blue Mountain Artists in Charlotte, right? Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which is a booking agency that represents more than 40 artists um, for international performances, at least eight of which are based in Louisiana. So he is very experienced in helping our Louisiana artists uh, get gigs around the world. Um, the, the topic for today is international festivals, promoting world culture in a global economic crisis. Now, the, the idea behind that topic was an assumption on my part that because of the global economic downturn, everybody is suffering even more than they have suffered in the past. That means that attendance is down, uh, sponsorship is down, and that means artist budgets are down, and it's that much higher, harder to hire artists, uh, especially if you're bringing artists in from overseas. Um, Peter Noble, I'd like to start with you because you and I chatted briefly the other day, and you told me that in your case, um, you've just had your most successful festival yet. So um, maybe my assumption was incorrect that the global <coughs> economic crisis is not necessarily the festival killer that we thought it was. Can you address that briefly? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I think that the recession is hitting at different levels around the world. And so, at least in Australia, we're not, it's not hitting too hard yet. And that doesn't mean it's not coming. But, um, so I think that that's one reason, and, and I think that the other was my festival's 20th birthday, and we had a, re a really strong bill. And I mean, these are the things that make a festival work. It's, it's every year I think people with festivals, you, you all go, well, if I can get the magic bill, then the people are going to come. And I may, I may have a certain amount of people that, you know, are going to come anyway, but to get that, you know, the, the cherry on the icing on the cake, you got to have the big acts. And, um, it's not that you don't go after it every year, but some years you just get the, you know, the, the magic bill. And uh, this year I had a great one, and we sold out three nights out of five. We also had 20 inches of rain in the two weeks before the festival, 
because we're in the subtropics, very much like Louisiana, and and um, and I think we had about eight inches of rain during the festival. It was the wettest one in 20 years. So not only did I have three nights out of five sold out, I also had something like 73 trucks loads of Bach mulch I had to pull in uh, every day trying to make pathways, and two hours later, you know, people are sinking. I think everybody here from Nolans kind of knows what I'm talking about. Um, it was a very interesting one. It was really hard work, and uh, and yeah, and about 90% of the people said they had the greatest time, and 10% said they'll never come back, but uh, because of the weather conditions. But certainly, we had the talent, and that's got a lot to do with it. Peter Talati, could I ask you to just talk briefly about how, what your experience in the past year or two has been in, in terms of the global economic crisis, how that's affected your festival in South Africa? Uh, <clears throat> uh, good morning, everybody. Um, what we have realized in South Africa from the past year or so was that uh, the audience didn't decline. The audiences kept coming. But what declined was the funding, the sponsorships, uh, started declining, mainly because maybe it's the cap I'm wearing, 2010 uh, FIFA Cup, because all sponsors started just thinking, World Cup, World Cup, World Cup, World Cup. And all money started going towards the sports. Um, and now and then, late this year, then they come the grunge, where the economic crisis just started hitting us. It, it was worse with us because most of our artists come from the United States and our money is 10 to 1 at this point. That means for one dollar, we pay 10 rand. And um, now the worst part of our, of our problems in South Africa is that we have competitors from the sponsors themselves, a lot of who think that they can do their own concerts. And we have no law regarding ho hoping, we have no law that can help us to stop them. And then we have another competitor, the government. Our government, government is, the biggest, is the biggest promoter in, in South Africa. The government is the biggest promoter. They do concerts and they do free concerts where people go for free and people sometimes with with other shows the, the ones of they think no why should we go to shows because the government will give them to us anyway that is that is what uh, troubles us but however with with the festivals it's a di it's it's a bit different in that it's a because of of, of festival uniqueness and Festivals being permanent features and people looking forward to it, you don't actually lose as much as if you do a once-off show. So we are hard hit, but not down. And uh, a lot of artists that we had booked uh, at the, towards the end of last year for our festival this year had to be cancelled. We had to re-look at the budgets and uh, and then relook at how we deal with air companies, affairs, and all that, because that's the other biggest impacting issue on, 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 on festivals, affairs, to the extent that I think in the coming years we will say to an artist, we will book you, but you must fly yourself here, <coughs> which, which is going there. And, the, and the, the, the days of first class are gone. The days of first class are gone. All the artists were booked this year. From here, are going there, are creating their own tickets. We are not paying business class. Otherwise, we'll close the doors. That's where we are. Uh, Maybe we'll have to go down to Australia to borrow some money. <laughs> just, don't bring, just, just, just don't bring Addy with you. <laughs> well, now, and your festival, the, the title sponsor is a bank. And, the, part, and, and part of the global economic crisis has been the banking meltdown. Yeah. Has that affected you directly? Uh, no. I would say no because we are lucky to have the sponsor like Standard Bank who, who have 
in this economic crunch, Standard Bank has seen uh, growth because they ventured into, into Europe, right up to Russia, they ventured into Asia, and while everybody around them is crying, Standard Bank is smiling. So they haven't cut our budgets yet. No, that hasn't affected us at all. Interesting. Yeah. Rick, you look like you're chomping at the bit. And when you and I talked about this uh, <laughs> topic a few weeks ago, you said, this is my life. Promoting world culture amid continual economic turmoil is what I do for a living. So can you just give us some thoughts? Uh, I would say, um, this year is hard to uh, gauge against previous years because for the first time in our history we had we lost a whole day due to rain. Our first Saturday, April 18th, we had to shut it down at 2 o'clock. Downtown Houston was flooded. Half our site was underwater. Uh, we've had to stop individual sets before, but never the, never the whole show. However, our second weekend, and particularly the final day last Sunday, was my, I haven't seen the final net yet, but it might have been the biggest day we've ever had. Uh, our festival is kind of a well-kept secret. We, our second weekend overlaps the first weekend of Jazz Fest and also overlaps Lisa's Festival International in Lafayette. We uh, have 12 stages plus a, a literary reading, so actually 13 stages, 12 performing stages, and our headliners top out kind of at the next level down. We don't have Sugar Land, but we have... Uh, Tony Bennett? Don't... Sorry. No, no, <laughs> Neville Brothers, no Bon Jovi. No, no bon Jovi. He, he, he wanted to, but I said, that's all right. Uh, no, we have uh, Neville Brothers, Buddy Guy, uh, Los Lobos, you know, headliners on that level. And I would say, based on what I've seen, our, our ticket price is $15 for adults. Kids are free. People came out. They spent money. Our food and beverage was great. Every year, the... Uh, theme of the festival changes. There's a different international region or nation. This year's honoree was Ireland, but we do certain things every year. African music, reggae music, salsa music, regional Gulf Coast music. We have a whole Louisiana stage, a whole Texas stage. The, ten, uh, the turnout was great. We did, we made 90% of sponsorship. We lost Washington Mutual, which was one of our longtime sponsors, and we were unable to replace them. We were hoping Wells Fargo would come in, but they didn't, and we never, so that left about a sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 hole that we never replaced. But 90% of sponsorship in this climate is pretty good. And, and so, and it could also be that Houston has not yet hit as hard as by the recession has some other areas, but I would have to say, actually, maybe people, instead of going to Disney World, they brought their kids out to our festival. We have a whole zone for kids. So, you know, the, for me, uh, maybe next year will be a bigger test. You know, if we're still, if this recession just deepens, you know, uh, we may not be hearing the same thing from artists. Though, la la when we started booking this festival last fall, everybody was talking about the price of gas, and so thirty thousand dollar acts became fifty thousand dollar acts, and maybe that'll go back down again. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk to our artist sellers. At the moment. We've been hearing from our artists, uh, from our talent buyers. Let's let's hear from from the sellers. Um, Peter Himberger, you, you work with artists at a very high level. Dr. John, Gypsy Kings, I mean, you're, you're dealing with folks that are always in demand, always going to be in demand. Uh, from your perspective, um, the fact that we are in this global economic crisis, are you, how are you seeing that um, reflected in the offers that are coming in, or is it, is it not? I mean, are, are people poor mouthing you, or are you saying, look, or, I mean, are you hearing from guys like Peter Tolati who are saying, uh, yes, you can come, but you gotta buy your own airplane ticket, or we're only gonna fly you, fly you coach? I mean, what are you, what are you seeing on your end? Well, uh, right now on my end, I haven't seen much at all. In fact, my artists have really good schedules. They've been booked for quite a while. <laughs> I don't think you've really seen the beginning of this economic crisis even start. Uh, it, it's going to come all the way down the line from air, airlines to gas to people who can't afford to come. Um, but it hasn't really started yet. Uh, my, my, my artists' schedules are full. They're torn as much as they can. Um, and so are you seeing, um, are you, what are you hearing from the buyers, the, your agents, about what the, what the, the buyers are saying well, in terms of the demand and, the, and the, their ability to meet your usual fees? Well, buyers always have a problem meeting my fees. They always have, <laughs> uh, even in good times. So um, I'm used to hearing it, but I, can, I think I can, I, can, I can feel their pain a lot more now. 
because I can see all around that uh, that times are tough. People uh, don't have the money to go out and spend large amounts of money, and uh, and 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 sponsorships are drying up. Um, people are, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, these these sponsorships at banks and everything. You, this is all have been budgeted, um, and it, you know it's it's money that's been budgeted, and you you it's going to go until it's done, which I think like next year you're going to start seeing a lot more people um, looking around for more money from everyone. Uh, but it's, you haven't seen the beginning of it yet, I don't think. It's Interesting. Um, Hugh, do you, want, do you want to talk from your perspective a little bit? Um, a, as a booking agent, you're dealing with artists at varying levels, uh, various stages in their careers. Um, what are, what are you hearing? I have a lot of road warriors, which is uh, uh, people that have to work all the time in order to support their families, so they're, they're not on the high income bracket level as some of these guys are. And the first thing that have gone down is the clubs. So we're dependent on the festivals, and we're dependent on international touring. And he's right that the festivals have their, their budgets were last year's, and so they still have their, their sponsorships holding on. So the, the fear is that as the clubs are going down in mass, and they are going down in mass, and they're not taking risk anymore because they've uh, they've lost so much money they're not going to do it anymore. You're hearing the word door deal way too much now, and um, so if the festivals go down in mass with it, we're in really bad trouble on the touring level. I work with you know eight of my New Orleans acts, and, and most of them are road warriors, and that's a, a kind of a different animal. In Europe, what I'm finding is everything's moving slower. Um, I'm getting my offers a lot later and I'm a little bit more concerned whether they're going to fill that hole because as the clubs dry up <coughs> in the U.S. and the mom and pop festivals that aren't sponsored are drying up in the U.S., we need to be able to get away and not overplay the remaining clubs and the remaining markets that we have because, I mean, you try to, you try to run a tour through the South right now and you try to pick up a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday on it for anybody, nobody's coming out. It's a joke. And uh, to try to connect Saturday to Saturday is you, you've got these one or two places or one, you know, Wednesday in the park or one Tuesday series or one Thursday at the square or one Friday that you can use to try to pull these things together. And if those sponsors for those events go next year and there's no club to play, these road warriors are going to thin out really, really hard. We need Europe, but again, I'm still getting offers for June and July right now and all of my U.S. stuff is done, and I've got these little holds. The musicians are calling me every day going, is it going to work? Is it going to work? Are we going? And I'm going, oh, God, I hope so. You know, but, you know, and the only thing that has happened good in uh, Europe is flights have gone down dramatically from last year. Last year we were paying $1,800 to fly to Spain. This year you can get there for 600 But um, everything else is just really scary right now. I feel a little bit of return, but I'm kind of confident. Yeah. I think we got a guy in charge that might help this time, so we'll see. Luciana, yes. can, can you tell us um, not just about uh, the, uh, the venue that you have in Rome, but also about the festivals that you've been doing and um, how you, you feel from your perspective in the heart of Europe uh, what, the, what the economic crisis is, is going to mean for you? Well, the, the, the situation is, is quite, quite serious, obviously, for, for us. He was telling. I mean, for us too. Uh, a few words, uh, if you agree about uh, our structure. I mean, it's quite a unique place because it was uh, thought of and, and supported uh, by the the city of Rome. So, uh, public administrations. Uh, four years ago, it was um, April uh, 2005. Decided to devote uh, one place, one big place, uh, to jazz music. So, it was a big, big, strong statement uh, because, as, as you know. Uh, jazz is suffering also in our country from uh, public support. And uh, this was one case. So it was the city of Rome, the mayor at the time, who decided that a special place is a, um, an old villa from the 30s uh, with a huge park and two other buildings that was confiscated to a gangster, to a mafia <laughs> boss. Uh, and with a special law that it was given to the uh, city uh, administration of Rome to be thought of a public use. So it was a private villa, now it's a, uh, a cultural center dedicated to jazz music. So it, was it the was gangster a jazz fan? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 but you know that connections between jazz and gangsters goes back way. Yeah. You know. I resemble so. that remark. 
<laughs> but uh, so it was it was a really a, a, a big case. I mean, all, all around Europe, because uh, the, the city of Rome spent like uh, over five million euros to restore this place and made it uh, a, a concert hall, uh, a library, a uh, multimedia uh, library, recording studios, rehearsal studios. So we have the outdoors where we can do uh, open air festival from end of June till beginning of September. So big, really. I mean, uh, four years later, uh, I think the city of Rome could have not afforded to think and, and, and support something like that. So uh, nowadays, the situation is that I keep hearing a lot of festivals that are mostly supported by the city or region or, or province administration that are uh, completely canceling. So they're, they're not happening this year due to the economical crisis. So they're canceling uh, events. Yeah. So uh, our situation is quite, <coughs> quite uh, difficult again because the, the, there's been a change in the public administration last year. Uh, so we have to face with a new administration who they uh, were not part of conceiving uh, a project like this if they were still going to support it uh, in such a massive way as before uh, and, and facing the new uh, economical uh, crisis. So uh, everything is reduced. Uh, the budgets are cut, so we, we are now confirmed that we can have a summer season of concerts, but with a much reduced bus budget, and confirmed just uh, a few weeks ago, so very, very, very late. Uh, the situation around, I mean, besides the big, huge festival like Umbria Jazz, for example, you know, that they uh, suffered them too because the, re the money that they had usually from the region has been uh, drastically cut, but they can count still, luckily, on, on many uh, private sponsors. The, the, the problem is that uh, the, the sponsor, the private sponsors that are investing usually in jazz are all the same. So everybody is knocking at the same doors. And even them have uh, decided to reduce their investments in, in culture. So I think uh, we're starting to see uh, the beginning of a very uh, serious uh, problem and uh, probably we're gonna face it even harder next year, I think. Lisa, we haven't heard from you yet. No. In, uh, here in, in Louisiana, uh, uh, certainly in New Orleans, I'm curious about how you're feeling it in, in Lafayette. It's been said here that the, um, the economic downturn hasn't been quite, we haven't felt it as much in our region, um, partly because we were all already in the dumps, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to Katrina and other things. Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling it in, in Lafayette, and is, how are you feeling it specifically as far as it's affecting you as a festival producer? Well, we really didn't feel it. I mean, our numbers were up this year. I guess the last two years we had crowd estimates of about 350,000 people throughout the five-day period, and early estimates are 400,000 this year. But we're in a different position because our festival is free. It's the largest free francophone festival in the United States. Um, we have six outdoor stages. It's, it takes place over a, um, a, about a 12 block area of downtown Lafayette. Um, crowds move very freely. People just love it. It's not very really crowd. Even with you know 400,000 people, you don't feel the crowds. But um, we 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 have music from about anywhere from 12 to 18 different countries Oops. in any given That's your year. <laughs> I do block bookings with uh, Rick a lot in Houston because, in, and also with Jazz Fest because, you know, bands can do like bam, 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 three weekends in a row. And that, uh, I don't work with a very large budget. My programming budget to pay artists is mm, about $125,000 for between 85 and 100 shows. So if you do the math there, it's not very much. But a lot of the artists that we book, um, get support from, from organizations in their countries for flights, or they're already on tour. And um, I, I think our festival has a great reputation for an experience that you don't get at a whole lot of festivals. It's, it's a very community-oriented festival. We have three full-time staff year-round, and over 1,500 volunteers who run the festival. So we don't have all that overhead of paying all these people um, we, we sell pins, um, you know, our slogan is your, your pin is your ticket to the world, and you don't have to buy a pin to come to the festival, it's not barricaded off, but our pins we sold for years for $5, this year we actually raised the price to $10, and I mean for about 
10 cents a show. I mean, you can't beat that price <laughs> in this economy. So um, we really haven't had it. I mean, the only thing that happened to us this year, I think, as a direct result of the economy was one of our headliners canceled the tour because venues who sold tickets weren't selling the tickets and, you know, and canceled on him, so he had to cancel his whole tour. So I was faced with finding a, um, a headliner replacement, you know, about a month or so out, was it, Rick? Say the name. Oh, Shayon Kuti in Egypt 80 from Nigeria had to cancel their tour. But, um, and, you know, we don't spend a whole lot of money on artists. It makes me feel awful sometimes. But they really are just knocking at our door, wanting to play the festival. It has such a great reputation. Many um, international artists um, get their foot in the door in the States performing at our event. I mean, people like Rokia Traore, um, Amadou and Miriam, you know, these guys who ended up getting U.S. agents. Um, this is the festival in Lafayette was the first place that they played. And, um, and, and we do help them, hook, hook them up with agents to, you know, a, a lot of them you might have five or six international groups who've never played in the U.S. before, and when they leave Lafayette, they've got an agent. Do you use your own local people as well? W what do you mean? For Oh, the musician? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. Very international. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. We, we book m music from New Orleans, from uh, around Lafayette. We do, you know, Cajun and Zotico, music indigenous of our area. And we also, um, we have an added perk for our performing artists. We, we host the Louisiana International Music Exchange. So we might have between 50 and 60 music buyers who come to the festival. Um, we, we have a, a small expo, it's nothing as big as sync up, I guess, but I mean, we, we maybe um, showcase about six lo uh, bands live and have expo space for about, I think we had 55 local bands this year. Everyone meets in the same room all day long on Friday, lots of food and drinks, and so many of our local artists get booked outside of the area, like in France or Belgium, Canada. Um, and also we provide space for the international artists who are in on Friday and if their agents are with them um, so that they can promote themselves to these m music buyers as well. So I think we had probably between maybe around 40, a little over 40 music buyers. Um, we, we host them, um, they have VIP passes, they can get backstage, VIP viewing area, they eat free all weekend. We provide transportation, we put them up at the artist, they pay their own fee but we, I mean our hotel rooms are Fifty dollars a night, and um, and we provide their transportation back and forth to the festival, and it's just a real on-hand experience with the artist. But um, I see Joe out there. We had a um, a group from uh, Brazil that was just wonderful, and um, Joe works in, in bringing uh, bands from Brazil to New Orleans, and uh, so we're looking forward to working with her again. They were fabulous. Seems like very much your problem. Yeah. I see a question Thanks. back there. Yeah, I was kind of uh, wondering, I want to cover for a model for you, because I was wondering if these uh, sort of cheaper festivals, is there a way that you can make that work for the artists? Because I feel like, I mean, I, I'm a bunch of where you're only paying for the same as all of the artists who have gas production set. I feel like, man, how does that, how does that work for you when you've got these artists who need that money uh, to sort of find their time and income? Well, it, it depends if we're able to route them. Uh, in the future, it's going to be more difficult. Like she did Bonorama for me this year who are here, and they've got eight gigs during Jazz Fest. So, you know, the, being able to go down and play Festival International Day Louisiana to them is a, a, a big deal, and they're w willing to be reasonable. Um, but if I had somebody coming from uh, – the, the whole problem with all these going on at the same time is if we're trying to get these and they're not the headliner acts that are being paid a lot of money – the routing with everybody funneling into this area at the same time is there's only a certain number of clubs people can play, and it becomes a cluster, whatever, to uh, <laughs> to get there. I mean, when I've got I've got 11 acts playing Jazz Fest, and I've got a certain number playing Memphis in May. I think I've four at Memphis in May this week, and then Festival International uh, Day Louisiana, and then there's Tulsa Blues Festival. There's just all of them going on at the same time. You book those and go, all right, now how the hell am I going to get them there? You know, and uh, and it's not like they're making, you know, hundred thousand dollars, and they can fly, and they can still walk up with a good day. It's a problem. And, you know, when there used to be, every town had 
you know, 40 venues and you could go, I'm taking you or you or you. Now everybody might have one. And everyone, as soon as you get that offer, we're all calling the same place trying to get it. And that puts them in a negotiating situation saying, you know, okay, everybody else is going to do a Dory deal or you. And then it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a lot different than it was four or five years ago. Door deal. door deal means that you get what you pay, make at the door. You don't have a guarantee. Yeah. Uh, I would add also in response to your question, I think you would agree that uh, although I try not to overpay for acts, uh, pretty, they're going to get a better deal from our festival than they're going to get playing a club with a guaranteed minimum against the door. Most they're also the going to sell merch. Yeah. You know, they're going to sell a lot of CDs. A lot of times, tours are survival is merch. I mean, you're breaking even on the on your concert sales, and hopefully, you're smart at the way you're doing your merch. You know, that's very important for intro bands. Learn how to merchandise. Did you have a follow-up question? <coughs> Well, as an agent, I book live performances. That's a management deal. Uh, I mean, you're, you're trying to get other ways to get exposure, but again, I'm not working with uh, Bon Jovi, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, I'm not getting whatever they're paying Bon Jovi. We've got to, we can't take a Tuesday night to be able to, or a Wednesday night just to be able to see. These guys got to be paid a certain amount of money to pay their band that are employees and their agent that are employees and their manager who employs and get their wives and children paid at the end of the week too. So you can't be, we can't give it away. Peter Noble, your event is in, um, it, it's in, I've never been there, but it's, it's in a- Why not? It, oh, I'd love to go. Uh, it happens right before Jazz Fest. It's a busy time and we're grateful for you to, um, to you for, for coming right after your event. It, is your, does your event coincide with any other uh, major events? Do you, or do you have the opportunity to do any um, piggybacking on other gigs or are you, um, pretty much a one-off for, for all the artists that, that come and play. Well, just, just to tell you about a festival, it's in a little town of 7,000 people called Byron Bay, which is like, uh, it's like, used to be the hippie capital of Australia. It's where they used to, you know, they even got their own brand of weed from there called Mullum Madness. Um, <laughs> and, they, and they have an, a, another festival just after mine called the Mardi Gras, <laughs> G-R-A-S-S. Um, so yeah, it was very alternate. Of course, that's now the money's all moved in and the hippies have moved further out. But uh, it seems to happen in the good parts of the world, ultimately. But um, so just, uh, just to give a quick background, we, we've, you know, I've been a promoter for a very long time and always been doing the alternates, you know, blues, jazz, reggae, all those sorts of things that certain times were never thought to be too commercially viable. And then to sort of well then into a festival where we don't get sponsorship. We never look for it. We always go, we're so alternate, we don't want sponsors unless they're like us, very green, very into, uh, you know, being aware on the planet. And we don't want no cigarette companies, liquor companies, or f car companies, nothing like that. You know, yes, I did a deal with Blackberry last year, but uh, you know. Um, so ju just to get to your question as quickly as I can by giving some background. Take your time. So, over the years, I've been very involved in Louisiana music and in coming here and always having um, a, a fairly large contingent of Louisiana artists playing the festival. This year, I had people like Tony Joe White, Lucinda Williams, Sonny Landreth, Terrence Simeon, and many more. One guy I had called Eugene Hideaway Bridges, by the way. You've never heard of him. And uh, he's the son of Hideaway Slim. <laughs> now, Hideaway Slim was a New Orleans artist if you, for the older people here. And, and he w couldn't get any work. He came up in the, in the church and, and he moved to London about 15 years ago. And he's been playing my festival now for about eight, 10 years. And you know, like, I'd walk by the stage and I'd hear a song. I go, oh, yeah, yeah. This year, well, when I walked by the stage, I stopped by for both sets. And I tell you what, for somebody from Louisiana who, who's never played in Louisiana as a grown man, who had two nominations for the Blues Awards last year, I hope he does get to play in your state because um, he really wants to come home. Um, but, but I've worked also, you know, with a lot of Louisiana artists and, um, and with my record label. Of course, I've, I've um, recorded a lot, you know, from Marva Wright to the Wild Magnolias to uh, we just won a Grammy with Terrence Simeon's first 
Zydeco Grammy last year. Terence and I have been working together for 20 years, um, 22 years. And um, so I'm just this guy from way down south who has had a Louisiana-style record label for <laughs> nearly 20 years. And, and, uh, and still, even this weekend, yesterday, we talked with the Wild Magnolias about getting them back in the studio. Well, both still got that great voice, the best voice I think I've almost ever heard out of New Orleans, uh, Dr. John may be accepted, but um, Aaron, but uh, so a anyway, so just going to the festival, how do you marry up a festival that's seven, 8,000 miles away from here with a whole bunch of Louisiana artists and how do you get Dave Matthews to come and Ben Harper and all those people that we get? Well, I was doing a whole bunch of other festivals. I had, that last year I had three other festivals, one happening in New Zealand, one in Tasmania, one near Melbourne, all on the same weekend. But I lost so much money, I gave it up. <laughs> Trying to do four festivals on one weekend, I just found I wasn't able to do it. Now, um, were you doing that because you were trying to provide additional bookings for these artists? I was in partnership with a major Australian promoter called Michael Chug, who I just bought out. And uh, now I own the festival after 20 years by myself. I bought Michael in the last four years. And he's the kind of guy that tours Coldplay and you know the big guys, and uh, Elton John, etc. But I, I just felt, you know, until last year, of course, we had Sugarland, but um, but I was kind of finding that it was just getting too much into commercial world for me. And uh, I'm into being very commercial. I'm into selling tickets. I'm into you want to come to my festival, you know, you're going to see the big guys on that stage. But if you come to the other stages, you're going to hear the music. And I, and and, I, and I'm also into um, creating a festival where everybody who's coming is multi generational. You know, it's a family event. But also, how do you get young people coming, you know? And I had to face that 10 or so years ago, like, gee, my, 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 my patronage of people is getting old. They're all hitting their 40s and 50s now. And so I purposefully went out there and tried to encourage young people. And so my median age group now is 30. I sell more tickets to women than men. Um, if you want to buy a ticket to my festival, you buy it through our website. So we know exactly who you are. We've got 92,000 people on our email list. Um, we know where you live, and we know how to, you know, get to you. But we don't hit you with anything, you know. No, no false. Uh, have, you know, you, you, if you sign up with us, you're not going to get asked to buy a credit card next month or something. Um, and so within that, we we do bring down an, an amount of talent who plays exclusively at the festival. Like Sonny Landis just came and he's in Australia for a whole four days. Um, we also tie in with promoters. And he did just that one show during the he time that he twice, was? He twice, yes. Played, but twice yes. at your event? Yeah. So you'll get them. So if somebody's coming all that way to play your event, you might give them two shows. I might give them three. All right. Um, <laughs> I do, I, I've entered into a deal with a venue in Australia, in Sydney, called the Sydney Opera House, which, has a, which is pretty famous. And, um, and we do a series there each Easter. And I just had bills going <coughs> through there, like Jules Holland, big band from England. and. Uh, a double bill with Angelique Kidjo and Ayo, who's this wonderful, wonderful artist that, oh my God, the next Sade, in my opinion. Um, she was the second highest CD seller on my grounds. Because we know, but we, I'm the sort of guy that if you, you, you come in there and you park your car, that money's coming into my festival's coffer. You buy water, coffee, liquor, merch, you name it, it's all coming to us. Because that's the sort of festival we've had to develop and be, because we don't have sponsorship. You know, it costs you 130 bucks a day to get into my event. Um, but that's how we've had to be that far away in the world, so we can make it all work and at the end of the day make a profit and, and still bring down the Dave Matthews of this world and people like that. Um, but I guess a lot of people here are probably thinking, well, how do I get my band on? How do I, you know, do that? Because I'm only touring six or eight bands and I've probably got another 10 suppliers around the country who... Um, you know, who were bringing bands to me. And, and I've looked all over. I, I've been to South Africa. I've been to Joburg with the guys from Oppie Copy. You know yeah. them? Yeah. Abisha and them. Yeah, and, and, um, and, and looked at, like, putting on a festival in South Africa the weekend before. And we tried one in the uh, Botanical Gardens there two years back. Mm -hmm. Michelle shopped in a few people. Um, I'm doing a new one in Singapore. It's just things that route people in. There's another festival that I built the weekend after my festival in Perth, which is the other side of the country. And they, they were a one day of this year with 12 and a half thousand, so thousand people. So, you know, we've got these other events occurring around us, but for most talent that wants to come in, if you're unknown, 
then it's, it's not much different than being on the door deal. Uh, you've got to find a way to get there and get on my <coughs> event, and you're still going to be playing, playing at 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon to, if you're lucky, three or 400 people. And this is how it works. And with all due respect, um, I, I have bands lining up to do that. And I, that, that doesn't mean we don't put some money toward them that would cover their airfares, uh, accommodation, and things like that. But uh, would they be taking anything home in their pockets? I doubt it. And, and yet we still get offers from real big bands wanting to break our territory. I just had Blues Traveler come in for a fee that was very acceptable because they'd never toured my country. And so therefore they hadn't built their market. Um, I'd probably get a half a dozen acts like that a year. Big Bad Voodoo Daddy was another one came in this year. And they want to break the market. So I'm not saying we don't pay the acts, but we don't pay them probably what they would get normally doing a fee in the US. Um, Australia's a very different market. I mean, there's artists like Dave Matthews who in my own territory, are nowhere near as big as Ben Harper. And that's because Ben in the early days came and toured the territory, built it up, became an arena act there, uh, whereas Dave would be lucky to sell 3,000 tickets, Ben's doing seven, eight. Um, I've been involved in so many of those artists, we're known as a festival that, I'll be quick, that, that, uh, that breaks talent. We've broken people as wide as Jack Johnson, Harper, Matthews, but also I, I love to be known as the festivals that bring out the blues artists and, and um, and very aware in those areas and very aware of culture. Thank you. Rick, did you want to say something? No, oh, okay. Peter Talati, can, can <coughs> you, um, yeah. do you how, do, how do you work it? Or do you have other events that are taking place near yours or in the same time frame where you can share some of those costs or do people come in for your festival on a one-off basis? Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we, South Africa is a very small market. I mean, we just, um, we, I'm sure we're a quarter of taxes, of the whole taxes, and we have uh, 45 million people. <laughs> and South Africa is a sporting country. I mean, uh, arts and culture takes about 30% of that. 70% of our country is sporting. I'm sure you all know because you have cricket, you have all this. So with the festival, there are, there are three festivals in South Africa, but at different times of the year. Uh, you are aware of the Grahamstown Arts Festival, which is everything. It's not music festival. And we have another one in Cape Town, which is a jazz festival. There are only two jazz festivals in the country. And unfortunately, because of the, of the size of the, of the market that we have, we tend to share the publicity because whoever whoever reads in Johannesburg will read it in Cape Town, will read it in Durban. So, and at the same time, the festival tried to attract. Joy of Jazz is supported 80% uh, by the people of of the region, and we had then the 20 other 20% comes from Africa, Europe, and and America. So we, what we have done is that we play acts who comes out of the country, out of the country, maybe from America, from Europe. We make sure that they play twice because our venues are smaller. We have seven venues and uh, are smaller than, you know, than, than here where you, are, you have an open ground. And so all our artists, so we decided that all artists that come out of the country have to play twice. They shouldn't come from America to play one night. They play twice, all our shows twice. Hence, we are very exclusive. Except if an artist is, got, is getting a booking at a club, which there are no club gigs anymore. You know, the clubs have died. They don't book shows. They just play DJs. So that's the problem. So. Do, you don't attribute that to the global economic downturn, though. That's something else, right? I think that uh, I can attribute to that. But it started long ago, before we, I mean, before AIG went out. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so, so, but we are, I mean, my partner is there. He's one of the guys. We're working to try and get back that culture so that artists will come from outside the country and be able to play at least three, four gigs. You know, and then they will charge us a little bit less than what we would pay them. <laughs> you know, and uh, that is that. Scott. Yes, uh, question. Uh, 
Have any of the producers been able to quantify or measure the economic impact of the events on, on your economies? Yes. Uh, for, 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 for our festival, we always we have the tourism uh, uh, organization, which is government, uh, doing research every year, where we know we can see the upturn in what is happening and the economic impact. We do that every year. And what do you think well, the event Well, the, the festivals are... You know, help a lot of of businesses around our area, especially the, the the tourist businesses, hospitality, most probably, and other businesses. When people come into the city, when they leave, everybody's smiling, except me, because I, <laughs> everybody smiles except me because I'll have very little margins of profit. <laughs> so. Our, you, you know, we, we, you can go onto website and you can check. You can check that. Uh, you want yeah, to can, I, can I just say something on that? Because I, 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 I realize time's going fast. But, but I think for festival organizers, you've really got to be up on this. You, you've got to do your studies. Because when you talk about, okay, in the age of recession, which I don't like to use that word. I mean, let's all just spend some money and get the world going again. And, and, and um, but for, for us, the, the, the state that I'm in, the state of New South Wales and Australia, we've done the studies. Our economic impact for the, our 2008 event was $13.54 million to our state. But on top of that, there's a local spend which was estimated at 12. Now, because of that, the government, the events section of our government gives me quite a bit of money to promote inbound tourism. And, and so instead of sponsorships, these are the areas where I think festival organizers can go if they can demonstrate this through accepted studies uh, of how to say, well, hey, this is what I'm worth to your state. And, and out of that, I was able to get an amount of money which I can't disclose by agreement, but, but it was very considerable. And then I had an idea of saying, well, look, I want to do an indigenous stage to present um, Australian Aboriginal people from far-flung communities. And, and so they funded that stage 100% this year. And I could bring in people from the South Pacific, from the islands, and to play. And sort of music that you would have to travel very far on the planet to actually go and hear. People that English is not their first language. And, and um, so things like that are what you can do to, to be able to de demonstrate your economic impacts. Rick, Lisa, do you all do economic impact analyses to show what your, your impact is on the region? We do, and also the Greater Houston uh, Visitors Bureau does it for us as well. We're the the uh, Houston Arts Alliance, which is the uh, foundation that disperses the money that comes in through the hotel motel tax and the uh, rental car tax, we're the largest recipient of that money. But it still represents a very small uh, percentage of our overall budget. The, uh, the reason I think our festival works, to be honest, it, Houston is never going to be New Orleans. It's never going to be Austin. People do not want to come here from New York. Uh, you know. To, people do not want to come to Houston particularly, even though we've got, in my opinion, good restaurants, just like New Orleans does. But, the, you know, we're not a tourist town particularly. People come to Houston to work. And so we've been able to put non-mainstream music, like Rashid Taha, like Roots Underground, like Plena Libre, high-quality artists, in front of family-friendly audiences who may not know who these people are, but they know that if they come to our festival, they're going to see something good that they've never heard before. Or they're going to see the iguanas, which they have heard before. Which, a, a world music festival unto itself. So um, I think that's why our festival works. Maybe 20% of our audience comes from out of the uh, four-county region and stays overnight, so we definitely do bring money in. But it's not necessarily lawyers flying down from Philadelphia for the weekend. It's people, dri it's people driving over from Austin or Beaumont or down from Dallas and, and spending money. Uh, and I, I just want to say one other thing. If you're out at the festival mid-afternoon, there's a band called Fofile. It's our kids. It's really good. <laughs> She's not biased, that's okay. <laughs> so um, we've got a few minutes left, and I want to thank all of you for taking your time and spending this very warm morning with us here, and thank all of you for putting up with the heat in the room. Um, so we're talking about the fact that, that there is this global economic downturn, and yet these, these events are going to continue one way or another. Yeah. Do, do you all view it 
as part of your, your mission in life to help uh, promote the culture of the world and, and by extension in s certain of our cases, the culture of Louisiana and New Orleans. I mean, Peter Himberger, in your case, you, you represent Dr. John. He's out there spreading the gospel of New Orleans everywhere he goes. Uh, I mean, his, his new record is, has been highly praised for its anger at the government response to um, the, the flooding in New Orleans. Uh, how, do, how, does, how do you and how do Dr. John view their, their, their role in promoting our culture? Well, you know, each artist is different. I mean, e even the Gypsy Kings like to promote their culture. I mean, that's what they're all about, and that's been what's been so successful for them, and Mac in particular, as you pointed out. He, uh, at every opportunity, probably even more so than himself, promotes himself, promotes, you know, New Orleans and, and musicians in general. So, uh, yeah, we feel, I don't think I would work with an artist that didn't feel, have that kind of attachment to to uh, what they do, because uh, if not, it, it just becomes really a business after that. So, yes, we, we, we and we, we use that to promote the artist as well and promote what they're doing. Uh, it just makes all the sense, I and mean, that's how I got started in the business, in, in, even with the Gypsy Kings, which was over 20 years ago. I mean, they don't, they don't speak any English. They really don't want to do any kind of promotion. So we really, we, we keyed in on, on their culture, and that's what really helped make that cool. Luciano, fr from the Italian perspective, you, you have an organization that promotes jazz, which is regarded as an American phenomenon, and yet it also has a distinguished history in Italy. How do you view your, your role in promoting the culture of the world at your institute? Well, I, I'm very interested, and actually it was my first time here at the festival, as you know, and uh, I'm enjoying most of it, really, because uh, it's a unique experience also to get to know artists that I... I'm not aware of, and uh, to know more about this scene. Uh, one thing I'm um, interested in saying is that uh, also to try to, to, to fight the situation, the economical situation, uh, we built uh, together with other uh, 25 different festivals around Italy uh, an association uh, called IJS. We just started, and uh, one of the purpose is really to uh, put together uh, common projects, and especially projects that are not usually um, dealt with uh, through agents or the, are not established name, but has a specific um, cultural value. So uh, I'm definitely open to, to proposal to, to, to share with the other, my colleagues, because I think it's very interesting. And uh, the, 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 the New Orleans scene, uh, the Louisiana scene, is not uh, known enough, for example, in our country, and definitely open to develop that. I see another question in the back. Go ahead. So the question is, is, is the export of American music still a viable proposition? C certainly. Absolutely. Cer um, oops, sorry. Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah, certainly it's still a viable proposition, uh, especially in my country where I said we're a very small group. So you can understand, before the Joy of Jazz in August, everybody has seen everybody. They've seen the acts, they repeat over themselves. So. Uh, an act from outside, from the U.S. coming in is, is a refreshing, you know, thing. And uh, saying that, uh, just going to your, to your question about the support of Louisiana, I mean, especially New Orleans uh, music. I first came here about 15 years ago, and I never stopped coming. And the musicians from here never stopped coming to South Africa. Uh, I've had, you know, almost all the Masalis family, except Winton, and uh, except Winton and his father, who is unable to travel. You know, I've had Donald Harrison, I've, got, I've had, you know, uh, Terence Blanchard, I've had, you know, a lot of musicians from here. And uh, we're still going to have that. And uh, as discussed with uh, with, with, with Scott, 
we are going to continue to do some sort of cultural exchange so that they can have access to South African musicians through us. And that goes for everybody. My friend here from Brazil, we are already talking about the 2010, and every other person who has interest in that. If your country is coming to South Africa, please do contact us. Zeke is there, he can give you tickets. We will work together. One thing He'll that- will give you a plane ticket right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we will work together if you bring your artists for the soccer cup to come and play at big uh, fan parks. You know, we are there, we will partner you. Right, there was a question can, in the back. Can, can I just, just come in on that oh, a little yes, bit? Please. Yeah, because it's not just, to, to me, it's not just about American music. It's, yeah. it's about all the great, great music of the world yeah. and having a, a, an opportunity to hear that. I mean, you think of wonderful yeah. artists from South Africa, like Vissi Malasela. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. Oh, and, and you know what? When you hear him play in the US, it's with an American band usually. I've got to tell you, those guys from out near Durban, they're in that township that's his real band. They are amazing. Yes. And I've been to their homes and heard it. And You know, they had that street party at New Year's Eve there. And, yeah. and <laughs> I, I mean, these are the things that you need to hear more. You don't hear anybody from Cuba anymore. And maybe under Obama, we might uh, actually say the, the freedom of culture might grow again. Because wouldn't it be great to have Cubanismo back? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, so you're answering a question that's been in my mind, which is, is your mission to promote world culture, is it decreasing Absolutely. in any way because of the crisis? And you're saying no. You're no. saying you're, you're as committed to your mission as ever. Lisa, would you agree? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's in, in addition to promoting world culture, it's just, which is, you know, what we do, our, our office seems to be just as I'm, I'm sure you get tons of calls all the time from festivals around the world or asking about jazz artists. We get that about Cajun and Zydeco music. I mean, I deal, deal with this. I get calls every day all the time. And um, so it's not really in my job description, but we definitely over the years have helped artists to get work outside of the area. So the gentleman in the hat. Fred. Hi. We have a serious problem in terms of exposing our particular unique cultural expressions because the size of the groups that we need to bring, uh, and as you have stated, most of the producers are not prepared to underwrite the cost of getting them there. Whereas we may be prepared to perform for very little or just the opportunity to expose the music. What is the possibility of some kind And then also partner with the major airlines and, and other sources of transportation to help that movement because individual governments may find it very difficult to do that. Several years ago, we had an exchange program and we, we had the opportunity many years ago, too long, to, to be here. And we're trying to get here again, but when we have to move 35 or 50 individuals to cause an impact, on the, on the uh, production or the uh, presentation is very, very difficult because we are known to the world. But we believe that we have a product that the world needs to know about and needs to experience. So it's a, a similar, uh, in case you weren't able to, to hear his comment, it's very difficult to move a large ensemble from a country like the Bahamas. Um, uh, if there's 35 to 50 people traveling. And what I was thinking as you were talking is that it might be a similar situation if you represent, say, an orchestra of, well, of 80 Mass members. Choir. Yeah. Sorry. Mississippi Mass Choir. The Mississippi yeah. Mass Choir. That's right. Now, have, have any of you presented a large ensemble? Well, yes. I, I would not be overly optimistic about airline sponsorship, though. <laughs> I mean, we, we always had an airline sponsor until the last two years. And, but it's been hard ever since, really, September 11th. The Continental has had a took a big loss again this quarter. Last year we brought the National Dance Theater of Ethiopia for their uh, North American debut and we had the support of Ethiopian Airways, which is I think the largest uh, independent carrier in Africa. When we did Ireland, they, they took them as far as DC, but then we had to get them from DC to Houston. And how many people was that? 24. So Although only 16 of them actually went home. 
<laughs> Which is why you will always have to have a work a work visa. What does that say about you? <laughs> and and, and, and uh, also uh, with Ireland, when we did Ireland previously, Aer Lingus was nationally owned. It's now an independent airline, so Aer Lingus was not a, a sponsor for us this year, and that affected the number of groups that we could bring from Ireland. Part of the choice with Ireland and with the Caribbean next year is you can do those acts without the support of a foreign government using Irish groups already in America or Caribbean groups for coming from Puerto Rico or in America. But what a lot of what a, a lot of what this depends on is um, is national governments determining that it's in their interest from a tourism perspective to go to other cities, other other countries to promote their artists in in hopes of spreading the word about tourism back to their their own countries. That's why I assume that's why you have Ireland as as a sponsor. Exactly. Although our, the Irish economy is in a free fall. Right. So, you know, but we sort of did see it coming. Sir. I'm Ziki Malusi, Johanna from South Africa. I think for me, Scott, what I want to just comment on is just put a bit of perspective in terms of world economy. It's important that we need to strike a balance between mature economies and developing economies because in both sets, there's going to be different requirements in terms of how we treat customers and how we see public private partnerships participating. Secondly, I think what becomes important is how do we take the promotion of music uh, festivals and juxtapose that to our nearest competitor, which is the promotion of sports sponsorship, because when you look at sports sponsorship, they don't have all the challenges that we're talking about, and yet, I think when you look at how they present themselves and what they have to deliver to consumers, it's almost the same set of requirements, and yet, they're not sitting with the challenges and the problems that we're sitting with. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the issue about public-private partnerships is a non-debatable issue for a developmental economy in the sense that it is important that the governments that uh, we pay taxes uh, to have got to help us as, as private institutions in terms of promotion of this culture and heritage uh, you know, for, for our nations. And also, again, I believe that as a marketer, it is important that we position ourselves to some of the global brands that operate globally. I mean, beer companies, cigarette companies, depending on the laws of the country, banks, mobile companies, all those people have got marketing and advertising strategies for which they look at sponsorship as a vehicle to help them drive their objectives and achieve some of their business objectives. So therefore, for me, I think as um, music promoters, then also become important that we need to wear heads of marketers and say, how do we make our products relevant to the various brands that these global companies are promoting in terms of trying to reach uh, the consumers? And then lastly, it is important that we do not devalue the role or the work that we do in terms of the promotion of music festivals in the sense that, number one, there is a definite spin-off in as far as tourism is concerned when you host these festivals. Secondly, most global or, or major cities are on the quest to position themselves and market themselves globally because they want to attract people to their cities. And then the third uh, thing is that there is a definite economic spin-off in the sense that when you have a whole lot of people converged in one city, it is definite that there is some form of consumerism that is happening and therefore it means that the local economy benefits out of that. And it is for that matter that I think we need to be able to pull together as music promoters and say, when we have some of these challenges, how do we put our minds together to try and address these challenges? Thanks. Next year I'm hiring you to be the moderator. <laughs> uh, I'd like to recognize Dan Storper from Putumayo Records. Uh, Dan, did you have a question? Yeah, I was um, you know, we've done a few theme tours. You mentioned Boozy. We did an Acoustic Africa tour, and it was quite successful. Sold out virtually all the places. The fundamental thing behind it, of course, was from a record label perspective, you want to sell CDs. The artists historically have benefited from selling CDs on tours and at festivals. The question is, really, now that CDs are declining, and to some extent, a lot of artists who do come over, I mean, this happened, I remember going to Womad, and being shocked that a couple of the really big groups that could have sold 500 or 1,000 CDs didn't come over with CDs. A, how are you are you still trying to find ways, or are you to encourage the artists and the labels to really participate 
both in promotion, marketing, and sales around their performance and sales at the venue. And now that you know, there really is a different breakdown of revenue for record companies. Oftentimes, it used to be 80% hard CD sales. Now it's more like a third, maybe even 50% for some labels with downloads, a third hard CD sales in stores, and a third on tour. How do you find that a way that can help artists who may not make much or anything from the touring to come over to your country, establish themselves in the market, and actually have a viable business? Well, there also used to be such a thing called tour support from record labels. And <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you I love the reaction on that. And there also used to be a phenomenon where record labels would actually be sponsors of events. So you would see a label's logo on an, uh, on an event sponsor list, yes. as, meaning that they were directly supporting the event as a way to promote the, the fact that their artists were there. How are you guys uh, addressing uh, merchandising and CDs and d dance question? Can I, can I just quickly say, well, there is still tour support. I just got tour support for James Hunter to bring him down to Australia. It was quite considerable. And like I said, uh, Rounder is now through Universal. But um, I always find this with, with these sort of things, they, get, they always get interesting toward the end. And I hope that they, you know, it doesn't, this doesn't end too quick. But we have a CD store at, at, at our particular festival, and we can tell you down, down to the unit what, we, what we've sold. And we were 6,000 bucks, I think, short this year on last year's figures. So we didn't go down. But, but there's all those artist signings and all those things that you do and where the artists can meet the public. And so there's all that impetus to go and buy the CD and have, him, have the artist sign it and you get to spend a couple minutes with him. And, and do it all at a very professional level is just really important to maintain the record company's interest. Now, we found the last two years in a row that our top seller was C6 Steve. And um, I don't know hardly anybody here in the U.S. knows who he is, but he can sell out the Royal Albert Hall in London. And um, he is easily, I mean, he's, he's like, to me, this, 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 this time's our old Burnside. And uh, if you all don't get him in the U.S. soon, and he comes from, I think, Arkansas or Mississippi originally, another man that moved away to, to get his fame. But um, he was up for a Brit Award this year, and Kanye West beat him out. But, uh, yeah, C60. But it's in marketing records. It's really important. We find that the bigger the, the, the bigger label acts at our festival don't sell near as much product because you can buy them in the store. Mm. You know, it, it, it's 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 these other acts that, that you got to search the bins for that get the sales. And those guys are getting those checks and they're taking them home with them. And when they put it all together with their t-shirt sales and their guarantees, it's actually worth coming and being there for everybody in the mix. Okay. Uh, yes, we had a question. Quick question uh, for you. Do you have a, a vision of what you'd like to see as far as merchandising at festivals? Just, I had thought of, it's a great point, with CD sales going down so much, it's hard for someone at Jazz Fest to walk over to the CD tent that's in the middle of the city and find it and know when the signing is, if, if you know, some of the stage, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I've, I've talked over the years with Quinn and others. I feel like there's, I mean, the, it's changed a lot because of the decline of percept, perceived values of CDs. There's an issue of pricing it used to be, and many artists still sell CDs for like 20 bucks in the US, which, or even $18, seems like just a little too much. Um, the locations of the, of the CD sales, you know, it's great for people, and actually it's easier now, I guess, to kind of go to that record tent. But I used to think that in some of the tents, they should have these side small CD sale booths so that someone walks from the stage, there's an announcement, you don't have to walk to that tent, by the time you walk there, you see, by other groups, you get there and you like this other group, and you lose that moment of feeling really excited about the CDs and uh, uh, and, and buying them. And, and Jacob Edgar, who had worked for me for many years, started a label called Kumbancha. We used to send him out. He would hold the CDs up and be waving around. I remember watching. We did a concert with Miriam McKeva when we launched the Homeland album, and I was watching these people leave. It was like a town hall or some venue, and people were just leaving. No one knew there were CDs for sale. It yeah. Somehow. It's one of my most frustrating things at a lot of events to have the announcer not say something about the fact that, hey, there's a new CD, or mm -hmm. at the end, if you liked your performance, go over there, or she's yeah. signing. And I think the connection and a, you know, upfront promotion before the event, retail presence before the event and after the event, the word of mouth, the accessibility at the event so that you can come off the stage and buy the CD, all of that has to be put together, and that will make it work you know, pretty well, and you can sell hundreds of CDs at an event if you do it the right way, and it's rarely done the right way. I, I, I just noticed I was I went to the uh, 
stand out there at the fairground, and I noticed that some of the CDs was being sold there for as high as 23 bucks. And you're just not going to sell CDs at that. I, I don't. You're just not. You you've got to be at parity with with what you can buy them for in the store. And I was watching little Ed was standing there. And there was no one walking up to him. He's standing by himself. I got like, man, I'd be embarrassed. I, I mean, there's got to be a way that that store is marketing that better so that people want to come by here, Ed. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody, but um, and 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 buy that CD possibly at a better price than you can in the store, and it all works in. I'll add something to that on behalf of the artist, though. If you're buying your CD from a record label for seven or eight bucks, and then you go to the festival and they're marking up 40 or 50 percent, they're taking 40 or 50 percent or 25 percent of your cut, do the math. You sell a CD for 12 bucks, you're making 50 cents. What's the point? You know, um, if they're, what they're banking on, if they're selling it for $20, they're going to be sitting there signing an autograph so you get something a little bit special. But you can't go in. I, I don't even know what Jazz Fest percentage is off of this. So I'm not taking anybody on, to, uh, on top of it. But remember, these guys aren't being given these CDs. They're so being sold at basically the same price a retail so, uh, store is being sold to them. And then the festival's taking a cut too. So everybody's got their hand in it. They can't give away a CD for twelve bucks out here. But I think I think the model of a, you know whatever fifteen dollar price in America for for the artists who's selling their own CDs that can in these other models, I think, you know, you have to adjust the model. You, do, you can't sell for $12 unless you're doing a major promotion. I was talking to the agent for James Hunter, and we were talking a little bit about the fact that here's a guy who is burgeoning, and we're going to do a rhythm and blues album. Hopefully he's going to be on it. There'll be artists like that that, you know, as well as some of the classic people like David Staples and others who have either been somewhat forgotten about, but the moment they start performing and people love them, They'll come off the stage and buy the CDs if they're available, if they're relatively affordable. Uh, Twenty dollars, twenty-three dollars. Just, I mean, people will still buy them. But they'll just buy a lot less. Twelve dollars. I don't think they need to be twelve dollars. And I think that you know, there's fundamental, you know, accessibility from a price and just easy to get perspective. All right, I promised these folks that I would have them out of here by 11, uh, by 11.45. It's past that. We've already lost Lisa Stafford. She's managing an artist that's performing an early set at Jazz Fest, so she had to run. Um, do we have any final comments for, from our panelists on uh, the, the challenges that we face in the global economic downturn? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter, please. <laughs> we, we have challenges. That cannot be disputed. Everybody has got challenges. And I think it's up to the, the festival organizers themselves to support each other and to share experiences and uh, share, you know, ways of combating the problems that we're facing. And to, for everybody to go back and talk to their governments, like we will talk to our government. We've got a new government, by the way. Got a new president in the house in South Africa. And we're hoping that he's going to come with new ideas of supporting arts and culture, which will impact with whoever supports us and vice versa. And uh, that's all I can say. Let's keep in touch. We, the promoters, festival promoters worldwide, don't keep in touch. Well, we're actually going to host a conference for, okay. festi for festival promoters in October in conjunction with our Blues Festival, the third weekend of October. So oh. hopefully we'll have all of you back here then. Okay. Can I just say real quickly, you know, the last time I was in this building, I was at a funeral. This is the funeral parlor we're in. <laughs> and uh, I guess I just got told that the, uh, I said, well, since it's a funeral parlor, the aircon's got to be real cold. But they said, no, they stole a whole bunch of the pipes just after Katrina. That's why we're all sweating here. But there was a gentleman who was going to be on this panel called Gerald Seligman yeah. from Womex, and he got very ill and he couldn't make it. And... Um, and as a result of that, I was able to get on. So uh, sorry, Gerald, but I'm very happy to have done it. But I'd like to say something about Warmex, which is the World Music Expo, which is happening in Copenhagen the end of October, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And as a person, again, who works with Louisiana Talent, my record label, I've tried to get uh, out Zydeco artists on, like Terence Simeon and, and, and people like that. And we haven't had any luck so far with uh, artists in this part of the world. So I do hope now that they're sponsoring they uh, actually vote to get uh, a whole bunch of showcases from people around here on in the future because I'm sure that all those festival buyers who go there will uh, hear that talent and a whole lot more talent from here will start playing in Europe and around the world. That's the idea. Yeah. Guys? Whose funeral was that we saw here? It was a jazz funeral and uh, <laughs> it was about 11, 12 years ago. It was a great event though. It was somebody really great. We had 
Dallas was here. Bo Dallas was here. Rock and Dopsy Jr. was here. Um, I just got told about it. And well, the guys. thank you all thank for you coming so from far and wide to participate in this panel. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Thanks. Hello.